password safety. So, first, can these answers be found on your Facebook account, or other social media accounts? Things like, what city did you grow up in? What's your dog's name? What high school did you attend? What's your favorite book? What's your dream job? What's your mother's maiden name? Most people, these questions, if they can't be found on their social media accounts, they know people who know the answers to these questions. The problem with doing this is because of security questions. Security questions exist on pretty much every website that requires a username and password. So, for instance, does something like this look familiar? It asks you first to enter in your birthday, then it asks you for your security questions. As you can see, these security questions are what I showed a couple slides ago. These are things that friends know, that family members know, that anyone who's your social media connection can find out lots of the answers to these questions. So, typically, users are very honest when it comes to security questions. Whenever it asks for their mother's maiden name, they put their mother's maiden name in that blank. Whenever they ask for their pet's name, they put their pet's name in the blank. So, malicious parties can utilize your social media account to find the answers to these questions, which then allows them to reset your password. So, this is especially a concern when people's Facebook, Twitter, or other accounts are public. Anyone can search the internet, find your account, then view the information on that account. So, the best practice is to not be honest when filling out these questions. Just treat the security questions as another password field. If it asks you for your pet's name, don't put your pet's name. Put something completely unrelated in that blank. If it asks for your mother's maiden name, do the same thing, put something completely unrelated to that blank. So, now you don't have that security concern with being able to share that information, or other people just finding out that personal information about you. The other problem with passwords is not just security questions, but it's users and poor password hygiene that they have in place or that they utilize. Typically, users practice risky behavior with respect to passwords. What I mean by that is they typically use the same password across all websites. Passwords now, very much so, can be a gateway into identity theft. That's because everything that we do nowadays is on the internet. Our bank is on the internet, our social media accounts are on the internet, email, everything goes through there. Once people gain access to your passwords, they really can ruin your life by changing them, sending emails to people, and accessing accounts that you don't want them to. So, what kind of things indicate poor password hygiene? First, people create passwords, typically, they might have to create a complicated password based off the requirements that a website or application requires. Because the password is kind of complicated, they have trouble remembering it. So, they take it and they write it down on a sticky note, and they slip it under their keyboard. Or they have an Excel document on their computer, that they write all of their passwords in. They don't realize that if someone walks by their desk, they can see what your password is. Chances are, you've used that password elsewhere. You've used it on your email or social media accounts. If you're saving all of your passwords to your computer on an Excel document, then if someone gains access to your computer or steals your computer, they have access to all of your passwords as well. The other thing that people do is they freely share their password with friends, family members, colleagues. They don't see a problem with it. They are never going to use it in any sort of malicious way or take my information. You don't know that for sure. This is more common in places where people have to clock in and clock out of work every day. If they are running late for work, they call their friend at the office already and tell them the password. They say, can you clock me in? Or if they have to leave early, they do the same thing. They tell their friend, here is my password. Can you clock me out at the end of the day? So, now it looks like they were at work the entire time. When it comes to passwords and password complexity, this is what users typically do. 
If it's an 8 character password, they put an elephant. If it requires a number, they just toss a number on the end of their core password, which was elephant. If you add a symbol, they put a number then an exclamation point on the end. Then, they capitalize the letter. So, if you notice, these passwords really aren't getting any more complicated. If I knew your password was elephant, then I could go to a website, see what requirements it says are needed for a strong password on the site, then toss in a number if that's what's required, or a symbol. It makes it much easier to find out what your password is if you follow this sort of process. When it comes to changing your password every 90 days, because some people see this as a hassle, they don't understand why they have to do this. This is what they end up doing. They go and they just change the number and the symbol at the end. Then, they go to the next button on the keyboard. Then, the next button on the keyboard, because it helps them to remember their passwords. Once again, you have that core of your password that is never changing at all. One of the beneficial reasons to change these passwords every 90 days is because of the data breaches and how often they are currently occurring. Passwords are extracted from these data breaches could be utilized to compromise your business. For instance, if a data breach happened and the password that was stolen was elephant. I will try to use it on different websites, maybe Facebook. Computers can carry up these tasks in fractions of a second. Except, instead of trying one website, they are trying hundreds of websites all at the same time, trying the password that was just stolen and all of the different variations on that password, numbers, symbols, and so forth. So, it becomes very easy if one is compromised, to take over all of your accounts. Even though you think that your password is different, if you're just changing those numbers and symbols, it's not strong enough. So, how do you help yourself to remember passwords or to create strong passwords? There's lots of password managers out there. What they do is they will help you to create a strong password, and it will even auto-fill your passwords into your web browser. So, whenever you start a new web session, it will ask you to enter in your master password, which is something that you should keep very complicated, and you should never tell anyone that password at all. Then, once you enter in that master password, if you go into any website that requires a username and password, it will be automatically completed for you. So, now you have one master password but every website on the internet will have its own unique password. So, if at any point, any of your websites or accounts are compromised, you don't have to go and change hundreds of websites' passwords. You just have to go change the one place where it was compromised. So, it saves you time and it makes things much safer. A great resource to know about when it comes to data breaches and passwords that are out there, online and different accounts, is what I like to call a password hygiene checkup. It comes from this website here. It currently checks over 210 website data breaches. Across those 210 websites, there's been 2.6 billion compromised usernames and passwords. I like to say, treat it like a credit check. Run it every so often. You can actually sign up for notifications so if there's ever a new data breach and your account was part of it, they'll let you know. Then, you can go and change the password and your security questions on that website. That's the other side of things. If a data breach happens, make sure to not just change your password, but change those security questions as well because those might have been compromised too. Another great resource to help protect you from data breaches and passwords being extracted is two-factor authentication. Sometimes it's called 2FA, as opposed to standard username and password practice, which is entering just your username and password. 2FA utilizes two different elements, something that the user knows, which is your password, and then something that the user has. Typically, that's some kind of token. Used in combination, they provide enhanced security for data access. So, then no one can break into your account unless they know your username, your password, and they have access to your cell phone. Make sure to enable two-factor authentication everywhere that you see it's available.
Lots of businesses are starting to now adopt two-factor authentication, but most personal websites, like email, social media, banking websites, are all moving to two-factor authentication, and most already have it implemented. So, some of the top tips for password safety. Make sure to use unique passwords across all websites and applications. Enable and utilize 2FA, or 2-factor authentication, on all websites that allow it. When you're creating security questions, make sure to choose unique, not true answers. So, that you don't have to worry about someone resetting your password by knowing information about your personal life, or finding information on your social media accounts. If a data breach does occur, make sure to fully change your password, not just the number and symbol, and make sure to change your security questions as well. Internet Protection The Internet is very large, of course, and there are lots of different components that come with Internet Protection. So, first, we'll cover search engine safety. Then, we'll hope into the benefits of web content filtering and what it is. Then, we'll get into HTTPS, what are secure websites, and how to know if the website is secure. Then, public Wi-Fi has some causes for concern when using public Wi-Fi. Then, finally, this Internet of Things that lots of people are talking about. What it is, what do you need to worry about with it, what security do you need to put in place. So, first, we'll touch on search engine safety. Nowadays, users really utilize search engines to ask every question they can think of. At work, they are typing in questions on how to do their job. How do I create this plan? How do I download a document or a template that looks like this already? Then, they are searching for things that they shouldn't be searching for at work. How do I download the newest CD, music, movie? Or how do I watch this TV show? The problem is they're also going ahead and clicking on the search results, without first checking if it's a legitimate site. They just click on the link and then they see where it takes them. This also commonly happens on social media websites as well. Because their friend posted it, that means that it must be safe, so they click on the link and they get infected. Even if the website is reputable, the advertisement being displayed could be malicious and infect your computer or mobile device. So, you need to be concerned, not just with the fact that websites are legitimate, but be cautious about advertisements on the pages. If there are tons and tons of advertisements on the page, sometimes it can be bad news. Then, free things, such as music, movies, game cheats, etc are very commonly filled with malware, and they are rarely what they say they are. So, not only is piracy a crime but when it comes to this, malicious actors prey on people who are looking for free things. Lots of times it doesn't even need to be illegal things or pirated things, like music or movies. It could be other things like documents to help you with your business, or free marketing plans and so forth. So, Keep in mind that free things are rarely what they say that they are. Some great tips to utilize when using search engines. Stick to clicking on sites on the first page of results. After you start going past the first page, start being very cautious about things that you click on, because of the fact that those are when you're getting into results that are not as reputable, not as commonly clicked on, and don't have as much of the related content as you might have searched for. Be careful when clicking on non-name recognizable sites. Also, make sure that free things malware is commonly them. Be very careful when you're downloading anything that says that it's free, because even if it is actually free and it is a legitimate download, they might put something on your computer that you didn't want. Lots of times software comes bundled with other software. So, you download one thing and it comes with three other things that you didn't really want. Be very careful when it comes to things that are described as free, because it can very commonly be malware. Next, Web Content Filter. A web content filter filters web traffic based off pre-configured policies set by the administrator. That means that the administrator could decide. At work, 
I don't want people to be able to search Facebook. Or, I don't want people to go to sports websites, or play fantasy football. So, you can put rules in place to not allow employees to do this. There are both home versions and corporate versions, of course. The corporate versions focus on employee productivity. If Facebook is allowed at work, sometimes that leads people to surf Facebook for several hours a day. Or they're always doing fantasy football, reading the sports, reading the news and so forth. So, web content filtering not just can restrict what sites users can go to, you can also restrict how long they can go to it for. So, you could say they can go to this website for 30 minutes a day, an hour a day, or what have you. The home version is usually for adult content filtering. Not only can it restrict the content that's displayed to a certain audience, it can also be utilized to filter malicious content and protect the user. This is another reason for them, because they want to make sure that users aren't going to those risky or non-reputable websites. By implementing a web content filter, not only can it help with productivity, or not only can it help protect your kids from going to bad websites, it can also help to protect you from any sort of malicious content, or those malicious advertisements that I mentioned. So, it has two different areas that it helps you with. Some top tips about web content filters are that they can increase employee productivity. Because then they have to do work. They don't have the ability to go and search these websites, like sports websites, fantasy football, or social media websites anymore. It curbs the risky user behavior of going to websites they've never seen, and it reduces malware exposure by having that in place. Because then they can't click those links, they can't open up the link in their email and so forth. Then it also has the ability to protect children's mobile devices and computers from displaying inappropriate content that you might not want them to see. So, this is one of those, that it can be useful in not just a business setting or a corporate setting, but also in a home setting. There's lots of different products out there that provide a web content filter. Next, HTTPS, or Secure Internet. So, HTTPS is a protocol for secure communication over a computer network, which is widely used on the Internet. It's typically notated by displaying a green lock in the web address bar. Basically, HTTPS is going ahead and making sure that your traffic is being sent from you, to whatever party is requesting it, without anyone in the middle reading it, intercepting it, or taking a look at it. So, it's sending it securely to wherever you might want it to go. No sensitive information should be typed into a page that is not secured by HTTPS. So, if there's a page requesting your information, like your phone number, your email, or even things like your credit card or social security number, make sure that it's secured by HTTPS before you type any of that information in. Sometimes people pretend to make it look like it's HTTPS by putting fake icons or writing on the screen that it's HTTPS. Sometimes, HTTPS has been compromised based off companies not doing it properly. So, you also want to make sure that the website is reputable and that HTTPS exists. Most browsers nowadays have begun to let users know, more easily, when they're on a non-secure page. Lots of browsers pop up a red thing in your address bar saying, this is not secure. Or they make you click on continue when you're going to a page that's not secure, letting you know that this is not a place where you should be entering in any sort of sensitive or confidential information. First, check to see if the site is secured by HTTPS, and head the warnings that your browser and the address bar gives you. Don't worry about what it says on the page itself, look in that address bar, because that's where the browser will be telling you whether it's safe or not, rather than going ahead and trusting all of these icons on the website itself. Then, make sure this is a reputable website before entering credit card information. There are review sites out there that help you decide if a website is reputable. Don't just go ahead and depend on that HTTPS indicator, Make sure that you're not entering information into a website that might be malicious. 
you can utilize lots of the tools that you used in the phishing email section. If there are misspellings on the website, grammatical errors on the website, if things don't look right, if their icons don't look right, those are some good identifiers that this is not a website that you want to be entering your information into.